Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. My name is Michael Schreiber, uh, the business is South Bay Customs. Oh, no, I've been obsessed with motorcycles for long before I was ever able to, to ride them. I mean, I was like the kid that always had every clipping of, and it wasn't a clipping out of a skateboard magazine, it was a clipping out of a motorcycle magazine plastered all over my, my bedroom walls when I was a kid. for a bunch of different dealers and industry you know, people of the last 20 years, maybe leading up to that. Different positions from technician to management, um, all kinds of different things. I was always the, kind of the guy that thought that I knew a better way to do something, always thought you know, I was right. And so uh, I finally got frustrated of working for other people and being told what to do. So I decided to quit my, my corporate job with Harley and uh, sold my classic car as well as my girlfriend sold her classic car. It was some, the seed money that we used to start South Bay Customs. South Bay Customs is motors, art, and music. I mean, it's not just a, you know, a, a slick motto. It's actually what we do. I mean, that's, that's our business model. I build motorcycles you know, during the day. That's my day job. An art gallery here in-house. My girlfriend, Robin, is an artist. She displays her art here on a regular basis. We bring in artists from all over the area, individual art shows or group art shows. And on a weekly basis, we also host live music um, from acts not only all around LA but all over the country. I've always been obsessed mechanically like from Legos and Erector sets to taking apart my mom's appliances when she wasn't looking when I was a kid you know. I never had a day of auto shop or any practical training it's all just sort of been a lifetime hobby, obsession, disorder, I don't know what you'd call it. There really isn't much of a process and sometimes that can be frustrating or a little disillusioning for my, my customers. You know, you see bike builds on TV where there's like, you know, CAD designs of a concept bike and there's a, there's a picture of what they're gonna build and this is what they're gonna get. And people get a little frustrated sometimes because I can't tell them exactly what it is that they're gonna end up with. I mean, I'll talk and I'll consult with people and get a lot of ideas of what they want. We'll come up with the general concept, but the idea of the, I mean, the end result will have changed five or ten times from beginning to end and I don't even know exactly how it's going to end up. The inspiration for the design was just a chance for me to do something just for me with nobody's input, exactly what I wanted, with no rules. That's, that was pretty much it. It's a culmination of everything that I grew up on, everything that I'm interested in, in terms of dirt bikes, street bikes, Harleys, hot rods. It's a little bit of everything, you know? All in a motorcycle that doesn't really fit into any one class. And that's what I like about it. People ask, like, you know, what style of bike is it? And it's like, it isn't. I don't know. Well, the, the motor, obviously, relates to, you know, a Harley. It's a 72 shovel head, which is very typical of like a, a Harley, you know, bobber or, uh, you know, build. Um, 
a lot of the controls, the hand controls, the front end, um, the foot controls are all very race inspired, you know, um, road racing. The tire, you know, it's got a nice wide, very blocky, slick rear tire, which is sort of very hot rod inspired, um, as well as the, the pipes, just two drag pipes, you know, almost like you would see on a top fuel dragster. The purpose of the build was to that la to at the end of last year to go to Bonneville and, and race during uh, the Speed Trials. The energy and the vibe out there, I mean, I don't know if you know much about the event or the history or whatever, but it, ha it has, its reputation is that of being very friendly and cooperative and, and you know, everybody helps each other and it, it did not disappoint at all. I mean, the people out there are so generous and good spirited and it's just it was a really it lived up to every expectation I had it was one of the greatest things if not like if not the greatest thing I ever did I mean racing down the legendary Bonneville salt flats at over 100 miles an hour on a machine that I built with my hands I mean it doesn't get any better than that sort of a bucket list you know I built the bike behind me for uh, a really good client. I'm actually one of my original clients when I first started the business, and he, ha he had an older bike that was sort of just like a problem child. You know, I mean, it was always here with something breaking and very frustrating, but he was really attached to it. One day, he decided that uh, he wanted to have a custom bike built by me, so we took the motor out of his bike that he had, you know, been so attached to forever, and that was the beginning of this project. It was, it was a pleasure working with him. He gave me complete artistic freedom. He, he had come to know me and my, and my building style over the years. Yeah, he just kind of dropped off the motor and uh, would check in from time to time on the progress, but gave us complete artistic freedom and it was, it was a pleasure to work on. I guess you'd call it a bobber. You know, that's the, the sort of style. Again, kind of heavily hot rod influenced, you know, from the exhaust, which sort of looks like, you know, maybe like uh, some old headers off of a, off of a, you know, an old 50s hot rod or something. A lot of rivets, um, you know, detailing, stuff like that. It's like riding a beach cruiser with a really fast motor on it. I mean, the thing is light. It literally feels like you're riding a bicycle, except, you know, a bicycle that does 130 miles an hour. <laughs> Not probably 120, but still faster than you really want to go. Yeah, it, it's shocking how well the bike handles. And that's really important in all the bikes that we build. I mean, it's fashion meets function, you know? There's no sense in having a really beautiful looking bike if you can't get on it and go ride it, you know? So you kind of have to mix the two. Because it's coming from my creativity, it's almost like I'm picking a little piece of me out and leaving it on every bike, so I almost feel like a piece of me is leaving with each bike. I think that's what my attachment is. Yeah, I mean, I, I have days where I question myself all the time, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, my worst day here is better than my best day working for somebody else. I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way. about Australia I, uh, through quite a few friends I had, Australian friends that had either come over for work or, you know, that I, I just met in other areas working at Ford Motor Company. Hi, I'm Craig Metros. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, currently based in Melbourne. Uh, I work for Ford Motor Company. I'm a uh, chief designer. Came over to Melbourne about five and a half years ago came over for a specific program and uh, have been leading that program ever since. Moving to Melbourne from Detroit was a, was a great opportunity for me. I mean, Melbourne's, what is it, in the top three most livable cities in the world. People here are passionate about 
you know, about cars, about art, surfing, all the, all the things in life that I really enjoy doing. I think uh, Australians, Melburnians, I just think they have a great work-life balance. It's just, it's a very balanced city. You know, I love the Australian sense of humor, just very easy going. I've made art on the side all my life, all my adult life. Yeah, I mean, my art, it's always changing. I started out doing watercolors and acrylics of race cars and sports cars and you know the automotive stuff and the motorcycle stuff that's happening actually influences me through my art. Just caught wind of some guys at work that uh, were talking about maybe getting together and finding a, an old garage or warehouse to rent. And uh, yeah, I just put up my hand and I was interested. It's uh, six guys. Half of us all work at Ford. We're, we're all workmates. It's just been great. You know, everyone really gets along. You know, everyone's interested in motorcycles and cars. And um, I'm the only one pursuing art, but I, I kind of like that. Working in the automotive industry, we work to tenths of a millimeter. Everything's very, you know, in data, very precise. And here, it, you know, it's, it's eyeballed, it's um, very fluid, not too many constraints. One of the big influences was coming to Melbourne and seeing all the graffiti and, and street art happening. There's a huge uh, street art and stencil scene here. So I don't know if it's obvious when people see my art, but I'm a huge movie fan and, 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 a, and a big music fan. I, I, I cannot work on my art without listening to music. And I grew up listening to rock and roll and once um, I started university at that time. Punk was very big on the scene, and that had a, a, a huge influence on me. Just the, the, the shift of you know, very precise music, you know, the rock and roll that was happening in the late 70s to, to punk was you know, a huge contrast. You know, I just love the fact that you know, everything that everyone knew about modern rock and roll at that time was basically turned on its head. And I, I kind of like the capture that raw energy and, and that different perspective in my art. To me, it's extremely artistic and, you know, it's, it's self-expression, which is what art is. My name is Murray Markwell. I have a uh, small American car restoration business in Pakenham called Southern Customs. And I should tell you that uh, the reason I'm a rev head, as we call it, or as the Americans call it, a gear head, is that uh, my father was in the automotive industry when I was growing up and of course uh, I remember fondly how uh, he worked for General Motors and used to go to the US when I was in my formative early pre-teen years and used to bring back all the uh, memorabilia and literature from the States and 
six nine Camaro colour brochures, you know, Chevelles and stuff, and I was pretty much hooked by then. So, uh, so as far as being a car kid, Dad used to take me to all the car races, so I used to like the uh, um, uh, early touring car championships, Tiranas, racing Monaros and Falcons and so forth, but uh, I think deep down under everything there was an American car fascination because uh, here in Australia we were starved with generally pretty crappy cars and pretty ordinary designs and pretty ordinary function. And uh, when you look at what, uh, what they got for the same uh, model years in the US, they were light years ahead in style and technology and performance. So uh, perhaps I was always uh, aspiring to, uh, to perhaps uh, you know, do better than what, uh, what we were given here in Australia. So um, American muscle cars is, uh, is where I'm at. The Plymouth Superbirds were built uh, in a limited run soon after what was called a Dodge Daytona, which was a run of 50, uh, 500 cars rather. It was uh, less than 2,000 Superbirds built and they were specifically built to homologate for NASCAR racing in the US. The engine in it is a, a 440 cubic inch, basically a, a HP Chrysler block, um, which are built for, as a six pack engine, built for high performance. So they've got very strong con rods, very strong crank, very strong everything. Um, it's modified beyond factory specs in that it has aluminum cylinder heads, it's got uh, um, bigger triple carb setups than come from the factory. It's got a monster big cam in it and uh, it sounds the part. So I don't care about gas mileage, and it sounds the part. So uh, probably 500 to 550 horsepower. Lots of torque, tire shredding torque, which pushes you back in the seat so you know when you're driving it. But uh, when you bury the foot into it and it pushes you back in the seat so far, you really enjoy that feeling because you don't get it out of anything. <laughs> anything that I've got anyway. So uh, it's the fastest car I own for the street, that's for sure. They were only built for one year because uh, once they creamed uh, and won all the races, uh, the NASCAR board, uh, powers that be, banned them. Uh, essentially said, if you want to run the aero cars, as they're called, you can run a five litre. Well, of course, compared to running a uh, seven and a half litre Hemi versus a five litre, it's all about cubes in the US. They, uh, they bit the bullet and got away, did away with the wings and so forth. So, so they had a special build that was designed in wind tunnels to, uh, to compete on the high speed loop circuits or the bank circuits in the US. I know from what I've read they really were a handful at high speeds because enormous downforce on the wing and very heavy at the rear and light in the front and so forth comparatively. So it was, it was, they got rid of them because the body governing NASCAR determined that they were too fast and therefore had a competitive advantage over everyone else and therefore said, OK, no more, uh, no more wings. So that's sort of what the, what the demise of the, the Superbirds and the Daytonas was. I've read stories where dealers were turning them back into basic road runners, so they would turn them over because the noses and the wings were even then too outrageous for the outrageous Americans of the 70s, so, um, which is a surprise. So, uh, so they were quitting them at a cheap price to get rid of them. Same time the uh, insurance crisis was going on in the US, gas price was going through the roof and uh, uh, there was a big mental change from that youthful 60s muscle car to Econo boxes that became the 70s cars. You know, they really lost all of that, uh, all the things that were great, which is one of the reasons I enjoy them so much. They are uh, uh, never to be made again. You'll never see them again. You'll never see poor fuel economy like that again. You'll never see poor handling, poor brakes, but you'll never see styling like that either. And you know, some of the styling cues and the touches. So in, in many respects, they're time capsules that you'll never see again of a, a bygone era. original 1970 Plymouth. It's a Plymouth GTX, started at 5,440, full manual, torque flight, reverse pattern.
being full manual it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Being full manual automatic makes it uh, extra special. Built by a dealer in the early 70s with new, all original new old stock parts. And you know what? I don't care that it's a clone because I can do this. That's what Ma Mopar is all about. Thank you for coming. Takes your orders every day. Every night they're on time. They don't Yeah.